faculty member at Bennington College, where she teaches classes on plastic pollution. She's also the president of Beyond Plastics. She, is a, she was a visiting scholar at Pace Law School. She was appointed by President Obama to serve as regional administrator for Region 2 of the US Environmental Protection Agency. She has also previously served as Deputy Secretary for the Environment in the New York Governor's Office. She's been a policy advisor to the New York State Attorney General, a senior environmental associate with NYPIRG, past president of the Hudson River Sloop Clearwater, former executive director of the nonprofit Resource Center, and most importantly, she was the former executive director of Environmental Advocates of New York. So welcome, Judith. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Josh. Uh, yes, I was Peter Iwanowitz when I was 23 years old, and some think I peaked too early. Um, I want to say I really miss no drama Obama. And, <clears throat> you know, we're all having such a hard time in our world. Um, and I, I have great difficulty transitioning from COVID deaths from the senseless death of George Floyd and countless other people of color. And so it just, it just seems appropriate to start tonight with just a moment of silence to honor their memories and to center our thoughts. If we could just start with that and then we'll get with the program, please. Thank you. Um, I hope you watched the movie, The Story of Plastics. If, if you didn't, there, there's still time. And I, I really appreciate this documentary because it weaves together how so many elements of the plastic pollution issue is actually an international human rights issue. Uh, this movie was actually produced by a feisty little nonprofit um, out in the Bay Area called The Story of Stuff. And I recently um, joined their board of directors. And I did that because I want to work more on reducing consumption, not just dealing with the after effects. Kate is going to talk about how we have to constantly um, just use a teaspoon on an, teaspoon on an overflowing bathtub. We've got to get to the root of the problem. Um, if you liked the movie, you can organize your own showing. Just go to storyofplastic.org and all the details are there. And my most sincere thanks to environmental advocates for organizing uh, this viewing and this discussion. So I teach a class on plastic pollution at Bennington College in Vermont. I believe it's the first class in the country at the college level on plastic pollution. And we had our last class last week, always a relief. And we were um, going around the room or the Zoom and talking about what the students were most impressed by in terms of the data and the information. And one of my students said um, something that really made my heart sing, that he got the lessons. He, John said, plastic pollution anywhere is plastic pollution everywhere. And when you think about the whole life cycle of plastic uh, generation and use, that is true. So I'm glad he got, he got the message of the class. Um, and I'm going to steal his line. I've been working on waste issues for a long time, including helping to shut down the Albany Answers garbage incinerator located in a low-income community of color in Arbor Hill in Albany, New York. It was finally shut down by Governor Mario Cuomo at the time. And it just seems like we never get to the root of the problem. And that's what this movie and this issue is about. For decades, the plastic industry uh, tried to convince us that if we just put our plastics into our recycling bin, everything would be fine. But that's not true. According to my old agency, the Environmental Protection Agency, we only recycle 8.5% plastics total. That is very, very low, especially when you compare it to other materials. You yourself should only put in the recycling bin 
number one plastic or number two plastic. If you're putting other plastics in your bin, it's probably going to countries that you saw, you saw depicted in the movie. Long term, we really need to shift to reusables. Uh, for instance, reusable grocery bags. New Yorkers use a staggering 23 billion plastic bags every year. And in New York, we have a plastic bag ban on the books as law. It was effective March 1st. In fact, people that um, live upstate, you probably know Stewart's Shops that has the best coffee, I think, upstate, much better than Starbucks. They put out a, a collector item. I'm one of the last Stewart's bags, a collector item. Please reuse me. By March 1, 2020, I will be replaced by reusable and paper bags. But what happened? Um, the plastic bag company out of Long Island sued New York. New York uh, DEC agreed to a 30-day delay on enforcing um, the law, and then it was extended twice because COVID hit. But now, um, I think enough time has passed, and we need to convince the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation to start enforcing our plastic bag ban. Um, last week, Beyond Plastics and Environmental Advocates and NYPIRG and others wrote a letter to the DEC. And instead of saying, yes, you're right, which is not what I expected them to say, but instead of um, agreeing to enforce the law, the DEC said retailers across the, the, retailers across the state are complying. Unfortunately, that's not true. So over the weekend, we put a call out to our Beyond Plastic followers, and already we have close to 100 people have uh, reported that their store is using plastic bags. So here's a takeaway from this webinar. Go to Beyond Plastics, it's plural, beyondplastics.org, and you'll see a form. And if your store is still using plastic bags, please let us know by filling out that form. And we're fundamentally nice people. We don't want to overwhelm the inboxes of DEC staff. So we will be giving them that form to show that we don't have widespread compliance with the law. There are other things we can do. School and college cafeterias can switch back to reusable containers. We need to expand the successful New York State bottle bill to cover things like lemonade and iced tea, which oddly is not included in the law. When you have a deposit on beverage containers, the recycling rate is significantly higher and you have the added benefit of preventing litter. Um, we support bills like uh, Assembly Member List Linda Rosenthal's bill that only allows for straws and stirrers upon request that will also save businesses money. And there's some real innovation happening in the business community. There's a, country, a company called Loop, L-O-O-P. They deliver food in reusable containers to your doorstep. We know there's a real interest in getting home delivery. So it's reusable metal containers, even Haagen-Dazs ice cream. You eat the ice cream, you rinse it out, and the next time Loop comes to your door, um, you return the container. It's like the old milkman model. So there are lots and lots of good ideas, but what we've been missing in New York and nationwide is the political leadership to drive down the production of plastic. And now we're all dealing with COVID. The plastics industry has been exploiting this health crisis since January. Um, in January, they called for a delay on the New York plastic bag ban. In March, they actually wrote to Health and Human Services Commissioner or Secretary Alex Azar and asked him to publicly denounce laws that reduce plastic use. I think Alex Azar was a little busier in mid-March doing things like getting ventilators to hospitals, and yet the plastic industry weighed in with that request. 
There's no evidence at all that redu reusable bags or reusable dishes are a COVID risk. In fact, according to a letter in the New England Journal of Medicine, COVID lasts for three days on plastic surfaces and one day on, met on cardboard surfaces. And if you have a reusable bag, you just have to be sure to wash it in water and soap from time to time. Yet, um, the Trump administration has put out some new reopening guidelines for restaurants. And it says that even if you're eating your food in the restaurant, hopefully socially distanced, they're advising restaurants to serve you on single-use disposable plates, cups, utensils, which makes no sense because the wait staff are going to have to be carrying back and forth, whether it's a real dish or a polystyrene dish. So we are quite concerned about how the plastics industry has been so aggressive in trying to exploit our health crisis to push this narrative that reusable um, items are not sanitary. And then of course, we've got to worry about all the masks and the gloves that are being littered um, all over streets and parking lots. Of course, we all need to wear masks, always. I might start sleeping with a mask, but I think uh, we also want to recognize the production risks of plastic production. You all know that plastics historically have been made from chemicals and oil. They're now mostly made from chemicals and a byproduct of hydrofracking called ethane. So what happens is imagine there's a fracking pad and typically the ethane is vented into the atmosphere, which is not good. It's a potent greenhouse gas. So instead, what we're starting to see is pipelines being built to these large manufacturing facilities called ethane crackers. How many have heard of an ethane cracker plant? Raise your figurative hand. Okay, a couple of you, that's great. So what happens is this byproduct of fracking is sent to the ethane cracker plant where it's heated to a high temperature, it's cracked, and it becomes ethylene, which is then a building block material for single use plastic packaging, like bags and bottles. The problem is that these facilities emit a massive amount of air toxins and also greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide. And, and we know we've all been working so hard to shift to energy efficiency and renewable energy sources to drive down carbon pollution, clean transportation choices. And what the petrochemical companies have decided is their new market is plastic production. If plastic production use grows as currently planned, by 2030, the emissions from these ethane cracker facilities will be the equivalent of 295 500 megawatt coal-fired power plants. So as we're, it's taken 50 years to close down coal plants, those carbon emissions will be replaced by ethane crackers. And for what? To make polystyrene, to make plastic straws, to make single-use plastic packaging. These facilities are proposed in Pennsylvania, Ohio, the Gulf Coast. And I don't have a lot of time to go into it now, but I urge you to Google Formosa, F-O-R-M-O-S-A. That's a big plastics company that wants to build new facilities in Cancer Alley, in Louisiana. Plastics is a health issue. Nine million metric tons of plastic enter the ocean every year. There are microplastics in the air we breathe, in the water we drink, and the food we eat. Microplastics has been found in beer, it's been found in salt, and let me explain how some of this enters our body. Let's say you have a single-use plastic water bottle. It gets littered on the streets of Manhattan. It rains a little bit, that bottle goes into the sewer, the storm drain. It goes to a sewage treatment plant, it's 
bypasses the plant somehow, maybe it's a rainy day and you have combined sewer overflows, it gets into the East River or the Hudson River. It then shoots out into the Atlantic Ocean. When a plastic bottle is exposed to sunlight, it's brittle. And then the wave action and the tidal action acts almost like a paper shredder. So one plastic bottle becomes hundreds or thousands of pieces of little bits of plastic. If it's five millimeters or less, it's considered a microplastic. In the next decade, there will be one pound of plastic in the ocean for every three pounds of fish, unless we change the way we use plastic and particularly plastic packaging. And again, if we don't change by 2050, the ratio is one to one. One pound of fish in the ocean, one pound of plastic. So what happens if we go back to the wave action and the little bits of plastic in the ocean is fish eat the plastic. Sea turtles, seabirds, marine life eat the plastic. And so what happens is we eat the fish and particularly it's a risk with shellfish. Shellfish that you eat whole like shrimp or mussels um, anything you eat whole will have microplastics in it. Scientists tell us uh, that once a week, you and I eat five grams of plastic every week, which is the equivalent of a credit card. Don't read my number. There's not much money in here. But this is a, we, you and I uh, eat a credit card or we either consume or breathe in a credit card worth of plastic every week into our body. I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that's not good for us. Although the medical research has a lot of catching up to do. Most plastic has been produced in the last 15 years. So this is actually a relatively new issue. Um, we've got a lot of information on our website. Please go to beyondplastics.org. In addition to this wonderful webinar, we are organizing a webinar on a very important federal bill called the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act, which drives down plastic pollution in a variety of ways. So we're doing a webinar with the House sponsor, Representative Lowenthal, and the staff of the Senate sponsor, Senator Udall, and that will be on June 19th at one o'clock. It's free. Just go to our website to sign up. Um, after that hour, you will be an expert on the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. You'll be very cool if you ever go out to parties again. You can say, hey, did you hear about the Udall Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act? Let me fill you in. It's Senate Bill 3262, House Bill 58. Four or five. Uh, not enough co-sponsors. Nadler is not a co-sponsor. Paul Tonko is not a co-sponsor. Um, uh, Hakeem Jeffries is not a co-sponsor. And Senator Schumer and Sh Senator Gillibrand are not co-sponsors. So please be inspired by this film and write to your House members and your two state senators and ask them to co-sponsor the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. Thanks very much. Thank you, Judith. That very eye-opening and sobering presentation. Um, so we are gonna hear now from Kate Carrera. She is Deputy Director of Environmental Advocates of New York. She is an attorney admitted to practice in New York and Victoria, Australia, and has expertise in environmental climate change, and water law. Kate has vast experience working with international, federal, and state governmental bodies, and she will share the New York context for us. Thanks, Josh, and thank you so much, Judith, and everyone um, for joining us, and um, uh, Assemblymember uh, Rosenthal and Assemblymember Fahey, I believe, are, are on the line, so I really um, welcome them and thank them for joining. We'll hear from them in a few minutes. Um, and 
I also just acknowledge there are some questions in the chat box and don't worry, we'll get to those um, as we as we continue. So the perspective I really wanted to add was just to inform everyone and get everyone up to speed on what's going on in New York State. So and there's a couple different um, aspects. It's what has New York already done to help address this plastic pollution and solid waste crisis, as well as things that are that are out there and that are important to support and, and important policy um, measures and mechanisms to, to help solve this problem um, and kind of where we're going. And um, I like to think of the policy solutions as kind of it's got it's got a number of prong, like number of prongs, I guess, um, because there's not one policy solution that will solve this problem. Um, and there are good examples in all three areas that are that are happening in New York, but I, I think it just as a place to start, I'd like to, to, to kind of make some analogies of how I see them. So the first is really turning the faucet off, right? So turning the, the faucet off of unnecessary single-use plastic products. And these are effectively bans on products. So as Judith mentioned, we have a ban on plastic bags in New York. And, you know, that's identifying and making a statement that this product is no longer necessary or useful and creates more harm um, or does more harm than it does good. So I think the, pol the different policy solutions that actually turn off the faucet and stop the production and use of certain plastics is incredibly important. So um, Judith already mentioned briefly, but you know, Assembly Member Ro Rosenthal sponsors a bill which um, provides straws on demand. So effectively really reduces the number of straws that would be in circulation um, in our environment as well as plastic stirs. Um, there are other pieces of legislation that have been sponsored by members of um, the legislature to, to address different ones. I know that Senator Kaminsky has a proposal out there to ban the use uh, or ban little plastic shampoo bottles. Um, there's actually a tremendous amount of plastic waste that comes from those little teeny bottles you take away at hotels. And if you think about how many of those little bottles get out into the waste stream from New York City hotels, just for instance, it's, it's staggering. So um, the first real policy, addressing the policy solution is by some of these bans. Um, the second is really managing the stream. So recognizing the fact that plastics are here to some extent and that whatever is here, we have to manage responsibly. And that's what we kind of talk about as producer responsibility, um, extended producer responsibility. And for those of you that are not really familiar with that concept, um, it's a concept where you hold the producer, so the manufacturer of the product, responsible for the life, cy life cycle of that product. Um, and that means that this producer, this manufacturer has a post-consumer life obligation. So you throw out, um, you know, you actually might be familiar, some of these programs already exist. So for electronic electronics or batteries, um, you know, you can take your batteries back to somewhere and the battery producer, Duracell, whatever, will have to do something with it. And actually, that's not even the best example. The best example is the bottle deposit schemes, which have been around since the 80s. Um, and that is actually the quintessential way to think of an EPR where Pepsi Cola and producers have a responsibility to collect that um, product, whether it be cans, glass, um, and then recycle, reuse, upcycle, downcycle. I mean, there's all sorts of different ways that material can be managed um, once it's collected and once it's taken back. Um, but the long, you know, the result is you're reducing the amount that goes through the waste stream and that gets into the environment. Um, the container um, deposit scheme was, you know, particularly successful in terms of reducing the number of plastic bottles that make their way into the environment, in part because people are collecting them up and bringing them out um, and getting a deposit for them. So the concept of producer responsibility has been around, but the idea of shifting it to all sorts of products in our, in our, in our community or in, in our life is, is a little bit new and is becoming more, no, I guess it's more novel. Um, in particular, there are proposals in the legisl New York le legislature now to have a similar approach to plastic packaging. And you know, personally, I find plastic packaging to be tremendously problematic. We try in our own lives to buy products that, are, that don't have as much packaging, but inevitably, you know, it's all packaged, right? And depending on what your shopping choices are or where you can shop, and if you have access to bulk food stores or, or not, not if everyone does, you inevitably 
end up with a large amount of plastic packaging, which can't be recycled. Despite what some of the pack, some of this type of pack packaging says, it cannot be put in your recycling bin. And actually, that type of plastic causes a tremendous amount of damage um, and and problems for your municipal recycling programs. Um, so that's something that's extremely important of thinking of how we manage packaging in the future. Um, so I guess what I really like about EPR and, you know, it, it really extends to things outside plastic as well. I mean, we can talk about EPR for um, carpets or, um, you know, any real product, I suppose, uh, paint. New York State passed a paint stewardship law, so now you can Bring, bring your paint back to the producer and they have responsibility to do something with it. So it's really an alternative model to that traditional linear economy of make something, use it and dispose it. Um, and something we often talk about in this, this space of being circular economy. If you think about the use of a product in a circle, right? You had, has some, it has a useful life and then it can be transferred back to something else. Um, you know, another, and then another important piece of this kind of policy spectrum, I guess, if I'm thinking of that. It's a Zoom meeting. I just asked that everyone just keeps it muted so we um, don't get distracted. Um, is how do we create policies that help shift consumer behavior? So that's an important part of it too. I know Judith mentioned in her talk, she's really focused on, of course, you know, initially like managing it, but in the end, it's about consumer choices and how much consumption consumers are actually making of these products. So we all share a responsibility in this, in this puzzle. Um, and so there are proposals in particular, I just like to call out um, assembly members Fahey bill that I particularly like. It's a great one about bring your own container. So this really just is an education piece in a lot of ways to consumers that they are allowed under the law to bring their own container to get reusable to get takeaway food or to get food um you know to get your leftovers um and not always having to accept um a disposable container so things of that nature um so those are kind of the three policy ways i i, I envision how we how we'll have to tackle this problem and i've already mentioned a couple throughout um but where we, where we are, and I think I've already mentioned this, um, we've heard about the plastic bags, but we also, the state ban, there was a state ban on polystyrene um, in the budget this year. So in 2022, um, you know, polystyrene will be, um, you know, banned in New York State, which is a great achievement. It's something that, you know, as a community, we're, we're very happy to see, I mean, certain counties, in New York have already banned polystyrene, Albany County being one of them. So we don't necessarily see polystyrene in Albany, but it will be something we don't see statewide. So that's a great accomplishment um, that the legislature and, and governor achieved this year in the budget. The plastic bags was last year. And, you know, there's a ways to go. And I've mentioned a number of proposals that are sitting out there. Um, another one in terms of um, reducing the shutoff is just actual bans on plastic water bottles. Um, and or, or changing the requirements for plastic water bottles to be made out of post-consumer content. So those are, I know, um, bills that Assemblymember Fahey has sponsored in the past um, and is sponsoring. So um, yeah, I guess that's, that's pretty much all I wanted to say. And I, I wanna leave enough time for questions because I think a lot of people do have questions. Um, I see them kind of rolling in and I wanna give um, the Assembly members a moment to, to say a few words. So thank you. Thank you, Kate. So yeah, we would love to invite Assembly Member Pat Fahey from Assembly District 109 to, to say a few words if, if you're interested. Uh, sure, uh, thank you. And uh, thanks to everybody for joining this and hello to my colleague, Linda Rosenthal, uh, who I haven't seen for a while now. So, uh, but we have been on uh, a number of calls, including a marathon one this morning. Uh, and I want to go back to something Judith said and just say how hard it is to even transition to, to talk about the environment, given um, all that has gone on, uh, especially this last week. And I think so many of us are reeling. So uh, thank you, Judith, for just the moment of silence. Uh, it's, um, uh, and, and before this weekend had happened, I was going to say just from the coronavirus, just from what's been going on in the last two months, 
uh, we have clearly backpedaled. So forgive me if I'm not talking about the glass half full and and uh, talking about some some tough subjects to to begin with here. But um, I have often some of you are, know me pretty well, and um, I've often talked about the frustration of working on a number of environmental issues that uh, the environment is is uh, really a back burner issue, right? So this year, a lot of success with getting some of those on the front burner getting a number of things done this year and last year, I should say, um, uh, you know, by the, by it, at the last minute and, and against many odds, but we got, we got a number of things done. I do worry now we have backpedaled um, and it's been alarming for me. I'm not a big takeout person, but just to support local businesses, I've done a lot, uh, a, a lot more takeout in the last couple of months and seeing things come out in a plastic bag and uh, even when you say no plastic bags i said no in order to carry it to you off the counter or to even bring it to the door it has to be in a plastic bag the utensils the this uh the restaurants now are all planning to use single use including the menus um and uh most of the containers uh, if you see love what started here in albany for those of you that are here locally with the whole um feed albany program uh the vast majority of the containers are the uh the black containers with the clear lids if anybody knows those rectangular containers it just sends me over the edge quite frankly so i um as much as i'm um, i've been very vocal about the whole coronavirus having this We've had this, uh, what I call a bias of trust toward big box stores, which those have been the only things that seem to be open in addition to grocery stores. Um, uh, but, but even among those uh, that, that are open, we, um, uh, as much, so as much as I want to support small businesses, it's been hard for me because I just hate those plastic bags. So we, we have done some backpedaling and um, uh, Judith, very interesting that uh, DEC is saying that uh, retailers are complying because that's just absolutely not true. It's just not happening. Uh, but there have been some good exceptions, which is, which is terrific. Uh, so um, uh, as much as we are backpedaling, I'm hoping that um, we will get past the worst of this. On, on many levels and, and get back to moving forward uh, again, and um, I, I, I have a number of bills. Thank you so much, Kate, uh, for, for mentioning a few of those. Um, but the, the one you did mention, the right to refill, we were actually, it was, as, it was, as, we got more press on that bill. I have a number of bills. We got more press on that bill than I've gotten on a host of bills in a long time. And I think it just struck people as, oh, you can refill that coffee mug when you're on the road and not have to get a new cup. And even that now we've backpedaled on, completely backpedaled. And now I'm seeing more plastic water bottles more than ever. Um, the governor at some of the press conferences, there's plastic water bottles in front of them. Uh, so, um, so the right to refill, I feel like is just in limbo for now, that bill. I have some others. I do have the bill that says um, any plastic water bottle, Within five years, it would have to be 100% uh, recycled content. The only one that's even close, I think, is Poland Spring uh, that uses more recycled uh, materials for their plastic water bottles. We actually talked about a complete ban, but realized that we just didn't have the infrastructure to do that. Uh, I have another bill on just any type of single-use beverage container it would be 75% of the next 10 years, sorry, in the next five years. Uh, but I, I'm just not sure how much we're going to be able to move some of those. Um, I, I've got a few others, but I want to talk about um, uh, a, a couple of other things. It, it's taken years to move that paint bill that you mentioned. Even then, it was a little bit more watered down than what we would have liked because it didn't have the deposit that I think was absolutely necessary. This polystyrene is great. Um, that's been, thank, thank God, some of this got done before this entire shutdown because I really think we would have gone even more backwards. Like, thank God the plastic bag bill is done because otherwise we'd be back to arguing from square one. And I can't even believe the comments that I'm getting from, um, uh, from retailers, let alone the, the grocery stores, let alone just individuals on, oh, but it's contaminated and uh, reusable bags. So, so we have work to do. It's taken years to get to this point. I, I feel like we need to talk about what are the strategies for going forward in a world that is completely not focused again on the environment. Um, 
Uh, so we need, we need more on that. Uh, the medical research has a lot of catching up to do that was mentioned and I couldn't agree more. But right now, uh, the research is really focused on um, the, the, so much of the, the health issues that are obviously necessary. Um, but one thing I do want to mention, uh, this is a bill that I started working on uh, under the pandemic because I thought the timing might be right. Uh, some of you know that many years ago, I worked for Paul Simon, Senator Paul Simon, for those of you that are old enough to remember him. Um, and uh, one of the bills that he carried many years ago and a number of members carried since then is a, a work, um, a job creation type program. And um, so I have introduced a 21st century type um, job creation, a WPA program, Works Progress Administration, based on the New Deal, uh, the success of the New Deal. And we've targeted primarily three different jobs of four, depending on how you look at it. But one of the jobs, we target young people because um, the people most impacted by the economic upheaval here with, um, with the pandemic, there's, there's three categories of people that have been most impacted. Youth, those under 35 and, um, 35 and younger, low wage workers, as well as people of color. So those are the three most impacted. And, and so this bill would target young people and we've targeted jobs that are easy to train for. And one of those are green type jobs. And I always use the example with the press of Solar, it, solar panel installation, weatherization, things of that nature, where you don't have a long training period, but you can grow this. And so I think, I think, and I'm not here just to promote my bill, but I do think that we have to talk about, um, we have to approach this from the side door because for us to just talk about save the environment and, and um, uh, the horrific uh, fallout of, of plastics and weather related disasters, I just, it's going to fall on deaf ears for the for the time being. So I think the more that we can talk about how we create jobs by doing right by the environment, the better off we uh, we may be in the short term. And uh, so I would like to talk about how we might create jobs. And and again, I I developed the bill. It's called the WPA dash PR. So it's the WPA pandemic recovery bill. Um, but really, it also fits with this past weekend. Uh, I, I believe some of the social unrest, there's many, many, many causes, including the horrific killing of George, George Floyd um, that, that ignited some of this. But I also believe it's tied to the, the desperation, the isolation, uh, and a lot of things that so many people have been suffering under uh, with um, uh, with the the pandemic, so so I also think talking about job creation and the uh, and uh, in the environmental needs through that avenue would be helpful as well. And I'll I'll stop there too. I have a few other comments, but I um, but I really would look forward to the questions. Sorry if that was even too long. <laughs> thank, thank you again. Thank you so much, Assembly Member. We appreciate having you on here and for all the work that you do. So thank you. I would now like to invite assembly member Linda Rosenthal to say a few words as well. Welcome Linda. I think you're on mute. I should know this by now. <laughs> unmute yourself before you speak. Okay. All right, I'm unmuted. Um, okay, I'm assembly member Linda Rosenthal. I represent the Upper West Side, parts of Hell's Kitchen in Manhattan. Um, I'm glad to be here and to join all of you how, and to discuss how we can reduce our reliance on single-use plastics. I also wanna thank Judith Ink, who I will follow anywhere, and, uh, and Kate from EA, and I've worked with EA for years and years, and so uh, I feel I'm in great uh, company here. Um, you know, March 1st, I held a bag giveaway. Uh, the city of New York provided those orange bags. Um, and I also bought like 500 of the bags as well, just to give out. And we gave out almost a thousand bags that day. I mean, it was as if you were giving away something for free, oh, but it was. But people were very enthusiastic about it. You know, they seemed, and it is the Upper West Side, but they seem to have accepted that this is how we're gonna go going forward. And, um, 
and they were eager to uh, talk about it and eager to start. Um, unfortunately, um, COVID then reared its head. Um, but I'll get back to that in a second. You know, I think New York State has made tremendous strides uh, in recent years. Uh, uh, where I guess we were the second state to ban single use. Uh, we did the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act um, to set us on a path toward 100% clean energy. We passed the Food Donation Food Scrap Recycling Act. Um, although I must say in the city of New York, uh, our um, food, what's it called, composting has been just cut off for the next at least year, which is a mistake. Um, people were just starting to get into that and were enthusiastic. And I had a whole workshop set up for April to encourage people to join, but then it got cut off. Um, as Pat mentioned, we did the ban on polystyrene, $3 million investment in the EPF. Um, and I was looking to um, forward to passing the bill I sponsor on banning straws. So in 2018, I started looking into the issue, uh, which un until recently, you know, people didn't really, I mean, the people who did were laser focused on straws, but a lot of people didn't even think about it or care about it. Um, but, you know, we're so accustomed to the restaurant when you sit there ordering a soda, you get a straw. It's in a glass, just drink it. Um, single juice boxes, straws attached. And um, people, Americans use 500 million plastic straws every day. That's an astounding number and more than 8 billion straws uh, lie around our beaches around the world. Um, the effect on marine life, the effect on just uh, pollution is enormous. Um, I mean, the poor, the poor animals are ingesting these straws. Um, they're found even in sea salt and our tap water. So working with Judith, Judith and others, EEA, um, the bill is crafted to prohibit restaurants and bars in the state from automatically providing a straw with every single beverage instead only when a customer asks and the reason that we put that part in is because we do have um to be sensitive to the concerns of the disabled community and many have talked to me and others saying that they they can't drink a drink like people who don't have those disabilities and they need to have the plastic straw. And we went through all the alternatives and they said, you know, they need the plastic. And that's why it's still there, but it's, it, you have to request it. Um, the other thing is the stirrers. Um, we ban plastic stirrers and you can use um, wood, you know, bamboo, any, anything else that, um, not plastic, something that is a uh, compostable, not just something not plastic, because you can have other other forms of stirs that are still going to, you know, pollute our, our uh, landfills or our waters. So after, so COVID threw a wrench into everything. I think the Green New Deal was, was ascending to one of the top issues that people were paying attention to. In the state, you know, a lot of us were looking forward to um, speeding up some of that climate change legislation that we had just passed and 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 getting there sooner and doing more things the the covid tragedy just threw a wrench in everything and now the george floyd and all of that is is another tragedy and i think that we will not be passing anything in albany that is not COVID related, that is not economy related, and that is not um, fixing our police system for the time being. Um, people's minds are not on the Green New Deal and the environment. However, I have great hope for November. I'm not sure what day it is, November 8th, 
second, whatever day it is, that we'll get a new president and then the Green New Deal will once again rise to prominence. And I think, you know, in as much as people have the bandwidth to think about things other than COVID and, and the police, uh, et cetera, we need to keep bringing up the environment because it still means a lot to people. It's they're just not thinking about it right now. Um, you know, when the when COVID started, people would post some people on Facebook, they'd say, you know, let's get rid of the bag thing now. It's a bad idea. I'm like, no, 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 you're not gonna sneak in and undo years of work based on, you know, a disaster in our health in in healthcare. So um, you know, there are still those out there who are trying to not they're trying to undo what we did, but it's very hard to undo that. And hopefully the DEC on just starting June 15th will um, start enforcing it. Um, I'm, I went to the store earlier today. I got a, well, I didn't get a plastic bag because I had my own bag, but um, they were still giving it out. Um, so I, I do have uh, hope for the future. Um, I have some other bills. Uh, I did the ban on uh, using glyphosate on state property and parks. And I was planning on working on that as well, uh, requiring climate change science in schools, passing the bill to ban coal tar, um, oyster shell tax credit. I had a lot of environment friendly bills. As I said, they're all for next year, but I'm hoping that next year we will see how we have to do these kinds of changes. We must. Um, we must change everything, but environment is further down the road than some of the other issues that we see people are suffering through today. So thank you for having me. And uh, yeah, soon we'll all work together on this. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Assembly Member. And thanks for all the work you do as well. It's, it's really important. I am now going to open it up for... Q&A. We have several questions in the chat, so we'll see how many we can get to. Um, you can also try to raise your virtual hand and we'll try to alternate a little bit. Um, we don't have that long for Q&A, so hopefully we'll, we'll answer most of yours. Um, so maybe I'll just start with uh, some of the initial ones. There are a couple, one from Melissa, one from Jeannie. They were both about uh, very specific questions. I think Judith, you might want to start with, but the first one is Melissa talks about in Rochester that they accept jugs, tubs, bottles, no numbers in the triangle. Are these really getting reused or maybe you meant recycled? No, and then only, only number one, number two, um, if it has that label uh, on the bottom, only number one and number two plastics get recycled. The, the rest is a myth, so don't put it in your recycling bin. And, the, and then Jeannie, thank you, Judith, and Jeannie pointed out that in Newburgh, there was a flyer that was sent out that, that they can recycle all numbers except number one and number four. So she had a question mm -hmm. about that. Well, that's totally wrong. <laughs> and I'm happy to call Newburgh or you can call Newburgh. Uh, you really can only recycle the chasing arrows one and two. Those are the only things that there are reliable markets for. Uh, if you're putting others in your recycling bin, you know, what often happens is it's given to quote waste brokers and then it's shipped overseas and it's what you see in the story of plastics. It is, it is not good. Um, so we, we gotta have to get clarity on that. Yeah, Judith, I might just clarify the question also that you're looking at it from the perspective of actually where it goes at the end while your municipality may say it does recycle certain different things that it that differs across the state and they may say they accept these things yet you're we're basically saying you're not certain that it's going that it's being recycled here yeah i'm positive you're that positive it's not, it's being... not. But I'm saying it's confusing to consumers of what to put in their bins because municipalities have different quote unquote, they will say they take different things depending on right. where they can send that material. So Right, so um, the municipalities have to start being more truthful. Um, shipping stuff to Asia that's not really recyclable is not what we want. 
And I can, sometimes you can get away with number five, but not these days, there's no markets. And I just wanna add, um, avoid black plastic. Assembly member Fahey mentioned, you know, the difficulty of all the takeout and it's clear tops and pl black plastic on the bottom. Material recovery facilities are MRFs. They have optical scanners and they don't see black plastic. So anything you put in your bin, if it's black plastic, even if it's one or two, gets, um, does not get recycled. And if you have, for instance, black plastic utensils, they are recycled from electronic waste. So when I first heard this, I went to my kitchen and I was shocked at the number of black plastic utensils I had in my draw, draw you know, spoons and, and various things. And so I just threw them all out. And at Bennington College, the food service director threw them all out. I, I, it felt terrible, um, but you can't recycle black plastic. If you have black plastic utensils in your kitchen, throw them out. They're made from electronic waste and replace it with uh, metal or wood. And, and the point actually about the black plastic made from electronic waste is that that electronic equipment is treated with PFAS chemicals often and a lot of other nasty things so that when you actually use it or heat it, um, you're transferring that to your body. So that's another good reason why you shouldn't be using the black plastic. To your egg omelet with a little black plastic with a broccoli. Anyway. Uh, we had a question about paper versus plastic and is paper really the environmentally better choice? I can, I can take that um, to start, Judith, you can add. I mean, so um, part of the reason that the bag, led, the reason we fought very hard um, for the, in the bag, uh, plastic bag ban bill was to, it, to have a fee attached to paper bags. Um, because while paper bags um, are not perhaps as insidious in the environment as plastic, um, they are, they take a lot of energy to produce. Um, so from a kind of a fossil fuel and climate change perspective, they're not a great option. Um, I think pinned up against a plastic bag, um, they're perhaps, like I said, perhaps um, the better option, but really the best option is reusable bags. So without um, a fee attached, you know, the state law that was passed, uh, municipalities and counties that do input, um, put the, have the ban, have the option to opt in to charging a 10 cent fee for paper bags. And we've seen that across the United States and that model really shifts consumer behavior so that the ideas that are the ideal scenario is that people are just bringing their own reusable bags um, and not using paper bags. Um, uh, and the other point about paper is that they take up from a solid waste perspective, they're much more bulky and take up a lot, they're much more volume. So um, there are, you know, it certainly would be saying use your own reusable bags, but in a pinch, I suppose the paper bag is better than plastic. And you, and you can recycle it. Right. Um, Plastic bags, if you try to recycle them, have a less than 5% recycling rate. Thank you. Uh, Guy had a question about whether the DEC letter that was sent and the response was publicly available. Is that something that we could share? Sure, yeah. Participants? Yeah, Great. I'll get it to you, Josh, sure. Thank you, thank you. Um, I'm gonna, we have several questions here. We're, we're, Obviously, not going to get to all of them, but um, Carol, I know that your your hand is raised. Would you like to ask your question? I think you're on mute as well. Those paper bags, bring them back in and reuse them again. I mean, if you treat them gently and kindly, they will last you a while. And if that's what they if they refuse to use your own cloth bags, just bring the paper bags in. If you can do it discreetly so they don't even know that they came from you, they are thinking they were generated there, if you can kind of, um, but reuse the paper as long as it'll hold up. I mean, that's another option. The problem is the people at the checkout um, are telling you you can't use reusable bags, whether it's paper or fabric. But if you um, put the stuff in the bag yourself, right. 
exactly. I was about to say, if you pack okay. yourself, yeah. um, you might be able to convince them. And well, the, you New need to the New York DEC did say publicly last week that stores should be allowing people to use reusable bags. And if they're not, you're supposed to report that to the DEC. I think it would be a whole lot more efficient if the DEC would just proactively say it's safe to use reusable bags, um, but instead they want to deal with it on a case-by-case -case basis. And if you need to, leave, just leave them in the cart and just pack into the cart. And that way you're not, they can't say you're contaminating the, you know, up the other part of the, you know, where the things are checked out, the checkout counter. So. And another thing I wanted to say, uh, as far as the takeout food, I've been trying to negotiate using my own dishes, but one thing you can do, restaurants have a supply of, of dishes that they have previously been serving people on, reusable dishes. You, can, you could try asking them to give you your food on one of their plates and borrow their utensils and push the food into your own reusable container. And you, sometimes you need to remind them, I'm the customer and you're making money on me. So, so I have a, you, that's something to negotiate. If they want you for a customer, they need to listen to how you would like to do it. Try it, might work. I, can, I just, can I just interject in there? Um, uh, uh, again, I know we're trying to solve this um, systemically and I, I really appreciate the good intentions, but right now so many small businesses and restaurants are so terrified of fines, so terrified of being shut down. Mm. Um, I, I've asked in certain instances, but I don't push it at all on these because they're just, um, they're all hanging by a thread with you know, yeah. estimates on how many restaurants will not come back. Uh, and how many, you know, uh, some estimates are as high as 40, over 40% 40 of jobs uh, currently of those laid off will not come back. I mean, there's mm. some terrific estimates. So, so I appreciate your sentiments. I just want to caution you. You do have to be very mindful that they're very nervous and be respectful of Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Survive, so. Good point. Thank you. And we are unfortunately a little bit past our hour. Um, I know there were several unanswered questions. Um, if folks want to reach out to us directly with very specific questions, we can, we can certainly respond and try to get you some of these answers. Um, we're also going to follow up tomorrow morning with several materials, and hopefully some of these will help answer some of the questions as well. Um, you know, we have a, a call, couple of calls to action we'll share with you tomorrow. One being the petition to sign on to demand that the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation enforce the plastic bag ban enforcement by June 15th, push back from the original March 1st date, and then also with that link so that folks can report instances where they've seen that people are not in compliance. Um, so, and Judith mentioned that earlier as well. Um, I know in one of the comments in the chat box was about Tops Instacart as well. Um, I've seen that at Hannaford's as well, that they are not allowing reusable bags inside. So we'll, we'll compile all of those, those details and we'll share those with the DEC. So keep a lookout for that link. Uh, we also have the federal Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act that Judith discussed. Um, and then we have a, a sample letter to the editor in LTE that a template that we have drafted. And we will share that with all of you as well. And we encourage you to submit that to your local paper um, and make it your own, of course, but we'll send a template tomorrow with the resources. So uh, one that, last, yeah. Okay, go. I was just gonna say one thing we can do with the chat is we can keep, we can look at this chat and um, save it and respond to some questions later if they're, if, if Great. just default, connect the loop for people who have questions we didn't get to. Yeah, happy to do that. Uh, the, the Story of Plastics team, I would like to thank them for sharing this film with all of us. Uh, they've been very generous with, with this film, but they've also asked all of us to complete a, a brief survey. So we will link that to the email tomorrow as well. It should take just about two to five minutes to fill it out. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you for being informed, staying informed, taking action on all of these important issues. Please have a great evening.
stay safe out there. Thank you, everyone. Great. Thank you so much for taking your time.